I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to our um, Illinois Forestry Association webinar series aimed at private landowners. Um, this series is funded uh, in part by the Illinois Forestry Development Council. What we try to do with this series is um, really give the basics and different aspects of forest management. Um, we hope that it's useful. Uh, yesterday we had a fantastic uh, talk on timber harvest and, and forest management and wildlife. Today is prescribed fire and its use as a forest management tool. And with that, I'm just going to open it up to uh, or go ahead and, and let uh, our speakers today. So we have two great presenters, Dr. Charles Ruffner from SIU and Jesse Reekman from the Southern Illinois Prescribed Burn Association. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that that um, Charles can start showing his screen. All right, can everyone hear me? Dr. Chris, am I on over there? Loud and clear. All right, outstanding. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such a, a big bunch checking in on these uh, webinars. Uh, as uh, Dr. Chris said, I'm Charles Ruffner. I'm in the Department of Forestry here at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And uh, I want to talk to you in the next 20, 25 minutes about the role of fire in maintaining oak woodlands, uh, really across the region, but particularly here in Illinois. Okay. So my brief outline for today should be just a, a brief history of fire in the central hardwoods. And what I'd like you to get from this uh, discussion is understanding the role fire has played in shaping the Midwestern landscape. And then I'll, I'll do about the five or 10 slides on a brief forest history, talking about the multiple disturbances, uh, lots of human disturbances, including fire, uh, and how they have impacted our forest for hundreds of years. And uh, then at the end, I want to talk about our current forest conditions that we experience in a lot of our forest areas and ecosystems in Illinois and the central hardwoods. And then uh, talk about, you know, what, what's driven those current forest conditions and then end real briefly with where we might be going or what we've been trying to do here in, in Illinois as far as move fire forward. And then I want to stop my comments because I know Jesse's going to pick up at that point um, when I'm finished up. So. If we look at this map of the eastern United States, you can see that uh, Illinois is right in this central area and we're smack dab in between the, the tall grass prairies of the Midwest uh, in Iowa and northern Missouri and all the way to northwestern Indiana. And then we're stuck in between the oak pine forests of the Ozark Plateau and the oak hickory pine forests of the Cumberland Plateau and even we, as you know we have some of the uh, southern species coming up from the southern uh, coastal plain. And if we look at much of the historic oak ecosystems in our state at least, uh, a lot of them occurred on dry expo exposed aspects, southern facing or southwest facing aspects, much drier conditions, oftentimes very shallow soils with uh, lots of surface rocks on the, uh, on the surface. And then uh, generally, historically, there's fairly sparse tree density. So maybe 30 to 50 trees per acre in many areas. Uh, many of these oak woodlands had a predominant prairie form of understory and uh, basically were maintained through frequent surface fires. But across this entire region of uh, Illinois, the Prairie State, and then Southern Illinois and the Western parts of Illinois, this historic range of variability across this region was really a continuum, just a spectrum of prairie here fading into woodland uh, and enclosed canopy forest as well. And it's really driven by several different features, including topography, hydrology of the site, and of course, uh, fire effects on that particular site. So just a, a brief look across the state, uh, up here in the Northwest, or excuse me, Northeast, we've got these beautiful black oak sand savannas uh, maintained by the TNC and the IDNR um, up in the Northeast, uh, along the Mississippi Hill Prairies, we've got these gorgeous hill prairies and oak pine forests. Uh, in Southern Illinois, we even have a few out, um, a few, 
small little sites that have uh, chestnut oak, a very fire tolerant species from back east. Uh, here in Piney Creek Reserve, Southern Illinois, we've got oak and pine growing together. And then across the Shawnee Hills, uh, we've got lots of oak woodlands, beautiful dry sites with lots of oak hickory forests. So just a nice picture, a couple pictures of the general oak ecosystems that we have in Illinois. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the early history of what we know about our forests and that, that information comes largely from the general land office surveys that were conducted between I believe 1803 and 1808 in this state. Well in those surveys the surveyors marked trees called witness trees at each of the quarter quarter sections and half quarter sections and quarter or excuse me section lines and we call it we, we utilize those those data to try and develop what's called witness tree analysis. And when we map those species or those witness trees across the landscape, we find that by far oak hickory had a higher dominance, a very low maple density in some of the uh, areas, particularly in Southern Illinois. And then when you read the surveyor accounts, they're just chock-a-block full of old historic accounts uh, of localized burning and clearing activities by, by Native Americans. Many of these surveys contain uh, terms indicating open burned over conditions such as fire blackened soil, burnt timber, burnt prairie. I've seen Indian cabins, I've seen burnt Indian cabins as a matter of fact, and then old fields. And throughout my years in the surveying industry, I came across a lot of references uh, in these surveys of things like, by the industry of the Indians, the land is very open and clear of woods, or other surveyors might comment, uh, you know, land open in spacious plains. So when you look at this historical data, it really kind of gives you a feel for what those species were and where they were occurring. I, my next slide here is a um, species frequency of pre-European settlement forests from witness tree analysis here in Jackson County, uh, Southern Illinois. On the left, you see a table, quite honestly, it's only got the higher eight or seven or eight species on it, beginning with uh, white oak, Quercus alba, black oak, Quercus volutina. You can see that uh, those two species account for over you know, 66, 68% of all the trees surveyed by the surveyors, but they have things like hickory and dogwood and black gum and sugar maple and ash and other species uh, throughout there. And then you can see as well on that table where those species predominated. Uh, the oaks or excuse me, predominate on many of the ridge tops and side slopes, uh, and some of the other species are more on side slopes or generally on toe slopes. And that little map on the right hand side is Macanda Township from one of my recent graduate student theses. And you can see the number of species actually represented by the different colored uh, indicators there. So they weren't just marking oak trees. They were marking all sorts of things like mulberry, post, sassafras. So not necessarily um, economically useful wood. I, I tend to believe they were clearly indicating what species they found closest to the witness corner. So it's a little bit on witness trees. Let's talk a little bit about oak adaptations to fire. Uh, and the xeric sites that they occur on. On the left-hand side, you see an image uh, from one of our fire history surveys of a uh, oak stem, uh, oak a cookie essentially. It's got a compartmentalized fire scar in there. So the fire adaptions, adaptations, excuse me, of oak are many. They include thick corky bark, which in insulates them, the cambium from injury by, you know, fires obviously. It has a wonderful resprouting capability from storing its large amounts of reserves in the roots. Uh, it is excellent at compartmentalizing fire scars, as you see in the uh, indicated picture below. After fires, that mineral soil bed that is exposed uh, is excellent for acorn germination. And really through recurring fires, many of those later successional fire intolerant species are largely reduced in number. If we look at the drought adaptations on the right, uh, you see four seedlings indicated on the left is a white oak, a, I think a pig nut hickory in the 
to the next to the left, and then the two on the right are sugar maple and tulip poplar. And what you see on the left, the drier site species have what's called a tap root. Um, so they have a very high root to shoot ratio. Most of their carbon is underground, and that allows them to be top killed by a fire and then re-sprout quite easily. Um, they also have xeromorphic leaves, uh, so they have sunken stomates, uh, very thick mesophyll, sometimes wacky, waxy coatings are on oak leaves as well. And then oaks are awesome at osmotic adjustment of leaf potential. And really what that does is during drought times, they're able to chemically alter the composition within their cell walls to pull more water in. That's called osmotic adjustment. So if we look at the forest history of Illinois, and I'm, I'm kind of sticking to much of Southern Illinois because it's where we have most of our oak forests or met much of our oak forests, but uh, looking at Dr. Fralish's paper from 2009, he and others have utilized kind of a three different time periods from the post contact to look at how disturbance regimes have changed through time. And before 1810, we think that the fire return interval was probably anywhere between 15 to up to 35, 40 years is not uncommon. And that really depends on the location. It depends on the types of speed, uh, vegetation found there and then the location of Native Americans nearby. We move into post settlement of about 1817, 1820 or so when we become a state up through 1930. And this is really the time period where lots and lots of people are moving into the state. And we see that fire return intervals at this time period go from 30 to 40 years or every year down to eight to 15 years. And we have actually seen uh, mean fire intervals as low as one one year in between fires on some sites. But generally during this time period, it's around three and a half to five years or so uh, during the settlement period. Then after 1930 uh, through the present time period, this is really when we talk about there's virtually been near total fire suppression after 1930. Some of the first fire uh, laws in the Northeast came in in 1895 and 1900, 1905. And by 1930, things were going strong across the Midwest and we have largely stopped fire on the landscape. Talk a little bit or show some of these historic pictures, this Euro-American settlement period between 1820 and 1930. Uh, this is a picture from the LaRue Pine Hills down here in Southern Illinois on the left. You can see there's an increased level of fire, lots of grazing going on in the forest, uh, timber cutting, or building snake rail fences, barns, buildings, shipping it downstream to places along the Mississippi to build those towns. Uh, so a lot of timber cutting was going on here. And that cutting essentially is what uh, regenerated our forest that we have today here on the Shawnee National Forest and across much of the, our state. So our current forest overstory established during that high cutting period of the late 19th century through the early 20th century. And during this time period, generally across the, the uh, deciduous biome, we see that oak hickory increases across virtually all slope positions. Uh, I want to include a little fire history image for you. This is from Shoal Creek down here in southern Illinois. And along the x-axis, you see a timeline from 1870 through 2009 or so. And then along the uh, y-axis, you see a bunch of different numbers. Those represent different tree cookies or stumps. And so this S33 is represented by this top line here. And its pith date is looks like it's about 1930 and its first fire was 1935 or so. So each one of these vertical lines that you see on the horizontal lines is an actual fire. So some trees like this one right here, S28, had five fires in a row. So mean fire interval of one. And then you see others that may have had maybe a 10 year interval or so in between those fires. So this is the fire history of one particular site. And you can see on the lower image, this, this is called the master fire chronology. You can see that our, mean, our major fire years are between about 1895 and 1935 or so. 
to show that impact on regeneration, this is from the same master's thesis, and uh, the red columns uh, on the figure indicate oak and hickory species recruiting during these different decades. And then the white uh, or the gray bars are shade tolerant, fire intolerant, maple and beech recruitment. And if we look along the timeline, again, we see lots of oak and hickory recruitment through the about the 1890s, late 1890s through the 1930s. Lots of fires in each of those decades. Uh, the, on this particular site, there was a timber sale in 1899. We found the deeds for them. But largely after 1938 or so, there are very, very few fires on this particular site. And we see a shift in our species composition from more of a fire tolerant to a fire intolerant. And this, these, these, this mesification uh, idea you may have heard about all across the, 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 the Midwest and the East, that's, this is the phenomenon that is occurring in lots of forests across this area. So what was going on in 1930? Smokey the Bear, right? So uh, this is one of our best uh, uh, public service announcements ever, uh, introducing Smokey the Bear to people that basically telling us that uh, we need to save our forests, put out all fires, only you can prevent forest fires. And again, prior to this, lots of states are enacting uh, anti-fire open burning uh, regulations and bans essentially uh, so that uh, fire comes off the landscape by about 1950. So if we look at this post-disturbance regime after 1930, there's several things going on here. Um, obviously with the fire suppression, you put that out, you want, you know, the CCC and so many different organizations were putting out fires quickly. Uh, we reduced our cutting intensity throughout this whole time period. We learned to get the cows and the pigs out of the forest, so we reduced the grazing pressure, and all of these factors result in a greatly increased uh, number of trees per acre we call density. Uh, it increases, if you look at the right-hand side image, that's from Trail of Tears, an old picture, but you can see the amount, that large tree in the center is a large uh, southern red oak, and everything around it is either a beech, maple, or a winged elm. So we're really seeing a large shift away from this oak hickory fire tolerant um, vegetation to more of a fire intolerant shade, um, fire intolerant shade tolerant later successional species. And we call that process mesification essentially. I'll give you a little bit of data here to show you that on the left hand side we have uh, here at Southern Illinois at Touch of Nature, we did an inventory a couple years ago and we can see that in our overstory trees as indicated on the right hand side we've got lots of white oak, red oak and hickory uh, represented in our overstory with lower numbers of these uh, maples and beeches. But then if you look to the right and the red regeneration class you can see that we have a few numbers of oaks and hickories, but largely this other category is winged elm, uh, ironwood, things like that. Um, so really not even, you know, timber quality type trees. And if we look across the state in our Illinois wide uh, forest inventory and analysis data, you can see that in the larger diameter classes on this X axis, they're largely predominated by oak, whereas in the seedling or excuse me, sapling and pole sizes, uh, in the one to six inch class, they're largely dominated by maples across the, and those are going to be our future um, overstory trees if we don't do so. So we look at our current forest composition across this region. We generally have 120 year to 150 year old mixed oak overstory. That overstory uh, has not regenerated to oak. It has regenerated largely to these mixed mesophytic species, more shade loving fire intolerance. And again, across the biome, we're seeing this oak hickory transition by sugar maple, beech, and other species. So this portends doom for many species on these landscapes. Uh, we're gonna lo start losing the keystone species of oak and hickory and that hard mass that is associated with so many wildlife species. And we're starting to see, well, for the last 10 years, we've done all the vegetation analysis to see that these unique and valuable habitats 
um, are blinking out, as are the threatened and endangered species that rely on those very valuable fire tolerant um, ecosystems. So it doesn't look good in, in many ways. So about 2004, 2005, across southern Illinois and really across the eastern deciduous biome, we started bringing fire back on the landscape. So we're teaching fire at uh, SIU and Shawnee's picking up, SIPA that you're going to hear from Jesse here in a second. There's lots of stuff going on across the state. TNC burning up north, all the forest preserve districts. Everybody's putting fire back on the ground and it's wonderful. So I want to end with just a few lessons learned so that we can have enough time here at the end after Jesse's presentation for some pictures, but just a few lessons learned of what we've done here in Southern Illinois as far as getting fire on the ground and how it's helped uh, in doing our oak woodland maintenance. We're trying to get at least two to three surface burns about every decade. More cutting must be done. Um, my early work here at Southern Illinois was trying to just use fire all the time and fire alone will not maintain your oak regeneration or even get it into the overstory. Um, there's generally a stand aside time period or fire free period after you get a regeneration cohort put together and they start moving up into the canopy. You've got to remove the canopy or get some light to the forest floor so that those regenerating seedlings can actually move upward. As far as fuel is concerned, uh, fuel beds certainly become more conducive to fire with repeated burning. If you've done one fire, maybe two fires on your property, you realize sometimes that first fire doesn't do very well, but with each successive burn, the fuel bed becomes more conducive. And my one caveat of negativity here is that in sometimes when we burn our forest, we lose what we call coarse woody debris. That's not chronic wasting disease, it's coarse woody debris. Those larger fuels that are on the ground that are habitat for critters and habitat for um, all kinds of things that live in there and live on top of them. As far as wildlife habitat, uh, we are seeing that the hard mast is indeed changing to a softer mast and that will alter species present on the landscape in the future. We know that many t and &E species, that and endangered species are tied to those open historic conditions when fire was much more frequent. And the grasses and forbs of the early successional understory are very, very important for turkey and other ground nesting birds when those poults come out and are being moved around by their parents to teach them how to forage and everything. That's got to be on the ground. So with that, I think I'm not going to take questions because Dr. Evans probably won't let me, but uh, maybe I will go off of sharing and then Chris might step in and let uh, Jesse introduce himself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Yes, um, so Jesse can start sharing his screen and we'll go into the second part. Uh, if anybody has any questions um, at all for Charles and, and what he talked about, go ahead and put it into the chat box and we'll keep those um, um, track of those and ask them at the end. Okay, thanks, Chris. And does this show up like I think it should? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, excellent. You can hear me okay. Great. Uh, well, uh, it, it's my honor to kind of take part two of this presentation here. Dr. Rupter was my major advisor in uh, grad school, so it's really fun to be able to, to kind of work together after all these years in, in the same industry and uh, still be sharing ideas and, and learning a ton. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. But uh, I'll just uh, kind of pick up where uh, Doc left off here um, in terms of bringing fire to private land, putting it on the landscapes around us and, uh, and around our, our privately owned properties. Um, I'll start by saying it's important to think about this kind of in a landscape scale because gone are the days of doing these, uh, you know, sort of backyard burns of 10 acres or 20 acres or even 40 acres, um, which was a great start. And that's how we had to start in the early 2000s when uh, prescribed burning was sort of uh, re reignited, if you will. Uh, here in the Midwest. Um, but uh, we've learned a lot since then, as, as Dr. Ruckner uh, explained, and now prescribed fire is necessarily happening across multiple ownerships. So public, private, uh, land trust, um, you know, every, every kind of land ownership in the state is now 
uh, beginning to use prescribed fire in a more um, corroborated and, and uh, coordinated way. Um, also, uh, it is now and, and, and has always been in this area, science driven and, uh, and supported by the best research that, that we have knowledge of. And I say that because, um, you know, obviously fire has uh, uh, kind of a connotation that, that follows it wherever it goes and, and for good reason. But, uh, but we really are, this whole region has been extremely responsible in looking at it as a management tool that should always be reassessed and reaffirmed and, and understood better and better at, at every turn. So that, uh, so that we're using it responsibly. And none of us ever want to get to the point where, you know, late in our careers, we're looking back and saying, geez, we really burned way too much back then. Or, you know, we really didn't know how to do it right. That would just be uh, uh, such a shame. And, and none of us want to be at that point. So we're trying our best to make sure that we're always at the, the top of our game and, and using this uh, resource responsibly. So uh, to kind of um, uh, segue here, we know why, uh, why fire was important historically, and, and uh, Doc did a great job of explaining kind of, you know, the forest type that we're trying to uh, rehabilitate and, and sort of the risk of what we're going to get if we don't, right? Um, there are other reasons why fire is being used on our landscape right now. So beyond your woodland uh, habitat management, um, there are also, you know, prairie and pollinator uh, concerns and, and pollinators, of course, are at the top of everybody's list of concerns right now. So that's another area where fire has been found uh, to be extremely beneficial. But also things like uh, the USDA's Conservation Reserve Program. These are just, uh, you know, government programs for landowners that are trying to rehabilitate certain ecotypes. And uh, the CRP program uh, recommends fire as a management type. And so these landowners are able to get that management done in a, an effective and efficient way, uh, which fire is, um, and, and, you know, uh, uh, satisfy the, the uh, uh, commitment that they've made um, to the U.S. government to, to be in this program. Obviously, invasives are a really big issue right now, and that's something you guys, uh, if you attend tomorrow's webinar, uh, you'll hear about, but uh, fire is uh, implicated in the control of those invasive species. And then uh, site prep uh, and, and uh, brush clearing is also another reason, especially among hunters and uh, people trying to uh, do real in-depth uh, reforestation. Um, and then finally, of course, oak restoration is, uh, is still kind of at the top of the list for reasons why fire is, is used uh, extensively now. Uh, and I'll say that uh, these are the results the effects that we're seeing on the landscape around us right now. And these are current pictures. Um, we're getting that reduction of the mid-story density. We're, we're actually getting more sunlight to the forest floor and that has become uh, almost a battle cry in this state um, to, to sort of uh, symbolize the um, forward progress, the momentum that we've got here with prescribed fire. And we're getting uh, uh, increased uh, den trees out of this. We're getting um, better oak grub survivability and we're getting that mix of uh, sort of the oak prairie, oak savanna, and, and woodland, and then forest uh, ecotypes that, that uh, historically uh, belong on this landscape, according to the research. And so, uh, because I said management is, is strongly science-driven, uh, every entity around that is practicing prescribed fire is connected to the latest research. And this is just an example, Joe Marshall's uh, heading up the Oak Woodlands and Forest Fire Consortium. Um, and, and the consortium really helps fire practitioners stay abreast of the latest knowledge. Um, they are uh, kind of act as a knowledge clearinghouse for uh, everything that, that's happening in fire right now, whether it's uh, grad student theses or uh, continuing research or uh, you know, white papers, uh, and, and then actually uh, uh, getting these, these uh, groups of practitioners together um, for in-person conferences and uh, continuing education, um, really make sure that this knowledge is 
out there and accessible and available for anybody that, that needs it, um, again, to make sure that we're all on the same page. Oh, and I, I'm going to jump back real quick. I'm going to try to give the website address for everything I'm talking about here as I go along. So uh, again, that's the uh, oakfirescience.com is, is where you're going to find the consortium there. And uh, we could maybe make this uh, contact information available later. I'll also mention the Illinois Prescribed Fire Council. This is another entity uh, who plays an important role in providing research to steer our usage of, of fire. They also track the accomplished prescribed fires annually, which is a really neat tool and allows all the practitioners to kind of see what their combined impact on the, the state is. Um, and then they uh, also are uh, one of the cooperators to put on the Midwest Prescribed Fire Symposium, which is a, a big deal for practitioners, again, to make sure they have that face-to-face -face time and um, are able to uh, avail themselves of the latest knowledge. One of the things that the Prescribed Fire Council has accomplished recently, which has been uh, exceedingly um, valuable, is the fire needs assessment. And some of you may have heard of this, but um, there were really some big lessons that, that were pulled out of that needs assessment. And, th and this was a, a real uh, uh, laborious process to, to get this assessment uh, put together and, uh, and to pull these, these um, meaningful uh, lessons out. And, and what, what was basically uh, discovered was that 20% um, of our you know, conservation lands are, are at this point too far gone to really uh, uh, carry fire effectively, which means that they, they will not um, benefit from the use of prescribed fire. 20% of our lands will not benefit from the use of prescribed fire to rehabilitate the oak hickory forest, which um, which is pretty sad if you think about, you know, what that leaves. Um, that's, that's a big loss for us. And then, and then uh, finally, without, uh, you know, supported uh, conservation, that just increases and, and that percentage just gets larger and larger. Uh, and it will shortly uh, become larger and larger in kind of an exponential way. And so uh, what they found uh, was that the estimate was, 213,000 more acres uh, in this state alone need to burn annually to uh, effectively manage, you know, what, what our, our end goal would be. And uh, that's just, um, just, a, just a huge number, uh, especially when you think about, um, you know, the, the acreages that agencies and, and private individuals are struggling to, to burn right now. That's just a, a huge number to try to uh, attain. But, uh, but let's talk a little bit about what's going on right now and, and, and how we're doing so far. Uh, Shawnee National Forest is uh, a local example to us anyway of um, how prescribed fire is kind of hitting the ground. Uh, they're doing about 12,000 acres annually and uh, their goals are pretty clear. Uh, woody encroachment, hazardous fuel reduction. Um, that's one we hadn't mentioned yet today, but uh, a very, very important reason to uh, make sure that we're running fire through some of these, these habitats before it builds up to the point where it is actually a wildfire danger, which uh, is very real in the Midwest, despite what, uh, what you may think. And we usually see wildfires out West um, as being kind of the, I don't know, more, more uh, visually exciting wildfire risks, but uh, it's very real here. Um, and then uh, habitat improvement, and uh, as I mentioned before, your prairies and grasslands. Um, and one of the things that the Shawnee is heading up, which is really cool and kind of cutting edge, is this growing season burn uh, idea. And, and it's not a new idea, but we are newly practicing it because typically in the growing season, um, we weren't very good at getting fires to burn through, uh, you know, the, the the understory of, of these forests, the uh, uh, fuels were pretty green and, and moist and it was kind of hard to do. And then we also didn't really know what the effects were because uh, we knew that uh, certain species were not in hibernation at that time um, of wildlife. So we were, you know, we were concerned about that, but then uh, we kept hearing these kind of anecdotal accounts of how growing these burns could, uh, could benefit and, and really knock back some of these invasive species that we're worried about right now. And so the Shawnee really took that 
and ran with it. And they're doing some great research right now um, by uh, putting these growing season burns on the landscape and then doing all this uh, pre and post data collection to sort of uh, get past the anecdotal and, and get some real hard data on, on uh, you know, what the effects are. Another thing they're doing is uh, kind of an interagency effort uh, in cross-boundary coordination, which is neat uh, because it basically uh, designs these landscape scale burns in coordination with uh, other agencies and with private individuals. So uh, the Southern Illinois Prescribed Burn Association, uh, the state's IDNR, TNC, and then all of these private landowners that own land in and around those properties. Um, we're getting these burns uh, designed, um, you know, in collaboration so that they're much bigger, uh, but then also much more efficient and effective. So uh, those, those burns are multifunded uh, and that makes them complex, but it makes them truly landscape scale, which is the only way that we see to get to that, that high number, that 200 some odd thousand extra acres that need to be burned according to the fire needs assessment. All right, another uh, agency who's making their mark on the landscape would be the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Um, they, one of the ways they're really supporting the effort right now is by making their uh, certified burn manager program, training program available to fire practitioners. And uh, that's both agency and private individuals. Um, so uh, that kind of helps train uh, more apprentices, but also gets more professionals into the system. And then those, those uh, prescribed burn managers, once they're certified, they can write IDNR burn plans and uh, they can lead you know, prescribed burns in the state, whether they're on private or agency land. So it's a big deal uh, to sort of push those people through the system and, and get them to a point where they can really make uh, some contribution. They're burning a little over 10,000 acres annually across all their divisions right now uh, for largely the same reasons that the Forest Service and, and the rest of us are. Uh, no ocean generation uh, management, and they're, they're taking part in the growing season burn uh, research as well. Um, they also are uh, increasingly using fire on private land as part of this uh, landscape collaboration. So you're going to see them on, uh, on private land ownership more and more in the future. Obviously, the Nature Conservancy is quite busy uh, with uh, you know, managing uh, their own habitat around the state uh, and using fire on those. But also now they've uh, developed a prescribed fire strike team, which kind of operates like their invasive species strike team. So the crew works real closely with the Forest Service and supports their larger burns that demand more resources. Um, which really amplifies the effectiveness of both agencies um, and, and any agency involved in that landscape scale burn. So we're starting to see TNC show up on a lot of uh, private land uh, that is adjacent to agency land. And then that burn, of course, is just being done all the way across that landscape. And, and uh, you've literally got private landowners working, you know, uh, arm in arm with uh, Forest Service, TNC, and ID and R. And uh, it's really quite something to see, actually. Uh, really love seeing all the resources out there. Uh, everybody's briefing together. Everybody's uh, uh, mixing their resources. You know, you've got crew members uh, uh, working together hand in hand. And um, it's really neat and, and very exciting because we're actually seeing some light at the end of the tunnel where if we, if we keep increasing our efforts like this, we're going to reach that, that uh, kind of, you know, cloud, uh, cloud in the sky number. Of, uh, of acres burned per year. Um, interesting uh, place to see this kind of in, in progress is the Trail of Tears State Forest down here in Southern Illinois. Uh, it's a multi-agency effort as most things are. Um, and they're uh, actually using their elevation and topography models to uh, apply fire in a um, kind of uneven way so that the uh, areas that are supposed to be burned with higher intensities and, and areas that are either not burned or burn, burned with lower intensities uh, are done so with kind of that scientific accuracy. And that's really neat. And, and it's starting to um, create this um, demonstration area in the Trail of Tears that is, we think, really going to be uh, uh, beneficial for 
practitioners, but also for the public so that uh, people will be able to go down and see what fire and thinning and overstory removal done in different combinations and, and with different timings, uh, see what the effect of all of that is on the landscape um, in an area where you can easily go um, from ridgetop to ridgetop and see you know, identical topographies and elevations uh, with identical species mixes and then different uh, management uh, regimes for those those areas so that you can compare and contrast what you're seeing with, with the different kinds of management. Um, something that uh, we had talked about and really, really hoped for for a long time, but uh, really finally came to fruition in the last few years. And again, those burns are being done with, you know, all hands on deck. We've got private landowners, uh, uh, agency folks, and everything in between. Um, helping on those burns and you know the Forest Service is bringing down helicopters to do aerial ignition we've got uh, nonprofit groups watching the the fire roads you know and, and it's just a really neat um, interagency and inner inner ownership uh, project also uh, that public outreach component um, probably hasn't um, been used to its full potential yet but I think uh, I think you, it will be and Again, if you get a chance to come down to Southern Illinois, definitely check that out. It's all publicly uh, accessible. Uh, just kind of over the border of, uh, of Illinois, we're seeing fire used for a lot of interesting uh, restoration down at Land Between the Lakes, just south of here. Um, they're actually recreating kind of a mid-1800s landscape um, that uh, is sort of restoring this woodland habitat, which you don't see much of uh, around here anymore. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of restoring what, what would have been a historical uh, landscape down there. And it's neat to go see another kind of demonstration area uh, where they're using fire and thinning uh, to um, kind of make that recreation area more historically accurate and in in the same uh, breath also more healthy just across the river uh, missouri department of conservation is doing a lot of management they've got kind of an interesting situation over there because their forest type is quite different than ours just across the river um, where they really uh got this pine oak woodland type that they're trying to restore and something that we don't have a ton of over here but uh they're doing pretty pretty hot fires and, and pretty heavy thinning and really opening up those woodlands and uh, and it's working and uh, they're getting that pine understory back. Um, one of the interesting things about Missouri is that they're starting to focus a lot more um, on their actual ecosystems uh, functions and structures instead of uh, just a timber focus which um, which uh, is great. We, you know, we really owe them a, a big thanks for um, kind of being, you know, uh, aggressively thinking ahead like that because, uh, you know, timber production has, has always been pretty healthy over there. And, uh, and this is really being driven by their foresters to uh, start looking at kind of the long-term impacts of that and, and start doing a lot more of this uh, restoration. Uh, just on the other side, on our side of the river, uh, Clifftop Alliance is another entity. They're a um, land trust uh, with a volunteer fire crew who's using prescribed fire as it historically occurred to uh, rehabilitate and manage some sensitive hill prairies kind of along the Mississippi bluffs, um, which is pretty neat stuff because these hill prairies uh, don't lend themselves to easy management, but, but fire is one tool that can be used where it's, you know, nearly inaccessible to, to people. Um, and this volunteer uh, prescribed burn crew that they're developing is now able to uh, bring fire also to private land uh, for you know, land belonging to the volunteers who, who help do this restoration. So, um, so it's kind of a co-op model, which, which again is, is what seems to be most successful in this state. Uh, speaking of co-op model, we've got the Joe Davies Conservation Foundation kind of up in northern Illinois in Joe Davies County. And uh, they've really got this, this co-op model kind of refined. They're uh, partnering with the Galena Territory Homeowner Association and the Prairie Enthusiasts. And they formed a co-op kind of similar to what we have down here in southern Illinois where members can get training uh, for free. And then after a year of serving on the, the burn crew, 
uh, for Joe Davis Conservation Foundation, they can then apply to burn on their own properties, um, which again is a very successful model for uh, neighbors to sort of help each other burn. Um, and uh, they're, they're uh, being very successful and in, in growing in their efforts. So if you live up in that area uh, and you're interested in getting by burning, uh, you should definitely take a look at them. That's jdcf.org. Uh, and of course, we'd be remiss uh, not to mention the student fire crew uh, led by Dr. Ruffner. So um, the Southern Illinois fire dogs uh, have uh, kind of historically been the best picks for a new hire when agencies around here are, are trying to fill new positions. And uh, that's thanks to the fact that they are, uh, you know, developed and, and trained in, in this environment uh, with, um, you know, these forest types. And um, often by the time they get into these uh, positions, um, locally already a lot of the players and a lot of the landowners in the area. And so they're able to just jump right in with both feet, uh, working closely with, you know, private landowners. And that's just absolutely invaluable. So. Um, again, a, a student prescribed fire crew, uh, basically an outdoor lab. Um, and, you know, they, they're kind of the next generation uh, coming up in the ranks. And then uh, we, you know, we, we take them on as apprentices uh, with the Prescribed Burn Association, um, sometimes hiring them as contractors, uh, you know, if we need extra leadership or skills on some of these burns. And then a lot of times, again, you start seeing them uh, you know, coming up in the ranks in the, the agencies. So that's definitely unique. Um, we, uh, uh, in, in Illinois, it, you know, fire, as I've, as I've been explaining, it is necessarily a joint effort. And you put all of these uh, groups together and it, it sort of ends up being just one big partnership. And this here is a, a picture of Dr. Ruffner and I at a, a I believe that was a fire consortium meeting. Um, or maybe that was a uh, prescribed burn assess or a prescribed burn council meeting. I think it was, um, but we're, uh, uh, we're all together on this and we're, you know, again, we're sharing all the data um, and we are often all on the same burns in some fashion. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, in just the last few minutes here about what makes fire accessible to the private landowner and kind of how, uh, you as a private landowner, if, if, uh, if you're in the audience here, um, should maybe go about um, getting fire on your, on your property. And it's not just as simple as lighting a match, obviously. Uh, the Prescribed Burn Act was uh, passed in 2007 for Illinois. And essentially, it officially recognizes burning as a normal kind of agricultural practice and outlines the basic steps uh, that a landowner should take before doing it but it also declares prescribed burning to not be a nuisance and, uh, and establishes uh, the uh, burning as a right of the owner as long as naturally occurring fuels are used. Um, one of the most important parts of this act is kind of the final bullet point here on the screen. You are liable upon proof of negligence, which means uh, that yes, of course, uh, the landowner is liable if they burn down the neighbor's farm, but it is upon proof of negligence. Uh, so it would have to be proven that uh, that landowner was you know, grossly out of order in terms of their planning and preparation for the burn. And um, that is a certain amount of protection for folks that are trying to burn their own properties uh, in, in Illinois. It's a big deal to have that kind of legal protection um, upon proof of negligence. So that kind of opened the doors for the Prescribed Burn Association uh, to form, and they, uh, they've been a co-op since 2006, but uh, it was really based on the fact that that Prescribed Burn Act was, uh, was about to pass and, and was going to give people kind of some new freedoms to manage their land. So uh, it helps landowners cover the responsibilities of that act by providing uh, certified prescribed burn managers, uh, burn plans that can be written for private land, and then a crew uh, that is, you know, at least mentally trained for prescribed fire and has the kind of uh, experience and, and leadership uh, in the ranks to, uh, to do these burns safely and efficiently. And so they do about 2,500 acres a year, kind of working hand in hand with uh, neighbors, agencies, and, and really just working over the fence line, we call it. That's how all of our communication kind of works, uh, neighbor to neighbor. 
and we're grant funded. Uh, it's a nonprofit um, and volunteer crews. So it's truly a, a co-op model. Uh, and that is uh, SIPBA.org um, if, uh, if anybody's interested. And they're, they're operating in the southern 11 counties of Illinois. So kind of everything south of Highway 13, if you're familiar with the uh, geography down here. Um, if uh, that kind of barn raising model doesn't fit your needs or you're not in the area uh, where that, that uh, association operates, there are contractors that can do prescribed burns. And um, there, you know, these are just two. These are just two of the contractors that, that we work uh, regularly with, but uh, there are certainly more in the state um, that will do everything from custom burn plans uh, based on your um, you know, habitat and needs and forest uh, and, and your uh, forest management plan, maybe your wildlife plan. And then they'll carry out the burns themselves with their own crews and you'll get professional results from them. Um, you know, and there's a cost associated with that, but uh, you know, the upside is that, uh, you know, if you're in a USDA conservation program, maybe, uh, maybe it's worth it, you know, and you need to get that burn done in a certain year and you need to get it done on a certain acreage. Um, there's nothing like hiring a contractor to make sure that gets done when and where you need it. Uh, and you don't have to wait for a volunteer cruise to be available or, you know, to, to wait in line for, um, you know, the other folks that may be ahead of you on the list. So, um, so that's definitely an upside to, to having a private contractor do that kind of work. Another uh, entity that's doing a lot of prescribed burning in the state right now are rural fire departments. Um, and just as an example, the Kell Department in uh, Marion County is using prescribed fires as kind of a fundraising activity. Um, and then they're, they're coupling it as wildfire training for their fire department members. So it's, it's a really neat way of uh, kind of augmenting their training, making sure that they're able to respond easily to wildfires in their area uh, because they've been setting them. They know how to do it. They know how to manage them. Um, and uh, if, if you know how to set a wildfire and, and, and fight a wildfire, uh, you've got prescribed burning figured out. And that's, that's, uh, that's what they're able to do. So uh, I just have a phone number for them. I don't have a web, web address, but that's kind of in central Illinois or, or central southern Illinois. And there are more fire departments around the state that are doing that kind of work. Um, the, but the important part is, uh, regardless of whether you use a burn association or, or contractor, or maybe you do it yourself, um, there are resources out there to help you learn about it and get certified to do it properly. And, and so the most important thing is that we do it safely and responsibly. Um, of course, the Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources has that burn manager certification. There's no reason why folks that are interested shouldn't give it a shot. And you can get most of those uh, uh, basic courses, the S-130 and S-190 uh, prerequisite courses are now available online. Um, if you go to nwcg.gov, uh, you can go to those, those courses and take them online. And once you get that down, um, you can start burning as an apprentice and, uh, and get yourself involved. And, and that really opens a lot of doors. And then uh, I would uh, also plug the, the burn association and, and other burn associations around the state. Um, for these uh, prescribed burning workshops, which are, you know, free training for, for anybody that's uh, interested. Um, and then a lot of times your local agency partners can also kind of help shepherd you through the process, whether you, you know, I, I would just contact them directly and let them know that you're interested in it and uh, see how they will um, be able to partner with you. And you might be surprised because agencies all over the state now um, this is on their minds, and this is kind of at the top of their, their list to, to find ways to partner with landowners. So uh, there's a lot of momentum here. I just want to kind of end. I, I always said at the beginning uh, that a, a, a lot of people are putting prescribed fire on the landscape. I mean, this is really just a sample of, of all the programs and projects that I'm aware of, but uh, it, there's a lot of it going on out there, and um, all you have to do is sort of add yourself to one of these groups, and, and you will be. Uh, in the know and you'll be trained and uh, you'll start to understand it better and then applying it to your own property is, is just a few steps away. So I'll just stop here because I, I understand there's probably going to be some questions and uh, I've talked long enough. So let me uh, stop sharing here and uh, we'll open it up to, to questions, I guess.
Great, thanks, Jesse. Um, we've had a few great questions um, already come in, and I hope people that have other questions, feel free to put them into the chat box. But I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, first question came in, um, pretty interesting one. It said that uh, Dr. Ruffner indicated that fire historically occurred maybe every 10 to 30 years on some of these sites, but then also said that in current times, we should be burning two to three times in a 10 year period. Um, what is the reasoning or need for so frequent burning and is that site dependent? Yeah, I saw that question, uh, Chris, and I wrote a couple notes down. Um, w there's two kind of components to prescribe fire that we think about, and one being restore restoration fire and maintenance fire. Um, restoration fire is that two to three burns in a decade to try and get rid of all of those mesophytic uh, species on the site to try and get some oak regeneration, get some herbaceous in the understory. And then after you've got the structure and the species composition that you want, then you back off and you may only have to burn once every decade, once every 15 to 20 years, again, depending on site productivity and site dryness. So I, I hope that answers the question. I, maybe someone else has something to say there, but it's really restoration burning and then maintenance burning. And there's really two different types of regimes there. All right, That's great, thanks. Fair. Yeah. Um, uh, the second part of that question, uh, and it's for both of you really, um, if there are limited resources, would it be better to conduct fewer fires across larger landscapes or multiple fires for smaller acreages? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that I think that's kind of why we're seeing the trend of uh, doing kind of these larger landscape scale burns where, you know, we're trying to erase as many of the uh, control lines as we can, because really, really that's less disturbance to the landscape itself and obviously less soil disturbance, uh, which is a good thing. But it also means that you can do larger units um, and just sort of erase the boundaries in between. So that's definitely a trend and, and you know, is good for that reason. Uh, but then there are areas where there's really nothing adjacent that lends itself to that kind of collaboration. And in that case, uh, groups like our uh, Southern Illinois Prescribed Burn Association still wants to be able to um, help that landowner, you know, attain their goals. And so if they've got 20 acres and it's not surrounded by something that's, you know, really appropriate to burn or not available to burn, uh, we still want to make an effort to make sure that landowner gets that that management done and so we are kind of positioned uniquely to uh to help that happen and we've done burns as small as you know one acre you know even you know half an acre in places because it's very very important to that landowner and they've been putting a lot of work into it and you know we're we're there for them that's that's something we still feel like we can we can do for them all righty great um a good question came in about are there special cautions um that you need to take for forest where walnuts are present or, or walnuts represent a significant portion of the trees and i'm assuming that's because of timber value and you could say the same thing for other high value trees yes yeah, and i directly uh said something to that individual i think it was michael on the line but uh one thing about walnut is is i mean they generally occur on flat alluvial terraces with like water nearby so they not necessarily a fire prone species or thought of as a fire prone species however i have heard several people talk about you know um these historic uh walnut almost plantations growing along these valleys that may have been burned by native americans through time that would have had a like a prairie understory so it's possible but if you wanted to protect those trees uh, here and on landowners property I'll go out the day before the burn and if it's not a huge property and there's good value in the trees we just rake around the trees or use a leaf blower to fireproof that particular tree I mean you just do it the day before the burn and it helps out so much um, so that that would be my answer to that particular question <clears throat> And Chris, I don't want to jump in, but did you see the question about the uh, increased red maple and sugar maple? And was anybody thinking about that? Can I answer that question or do you have others picked out? Um, yeah, go right ahead. 
you can well, answer. Well, I thought that was a very interesting question. And indeed, 1976, Richard Schlesinger was a professor at Ohio State. And in the very first, I think it was maybe the first or second paper of the first Central Hardwoods Forest Conference, he authored a paper saying, the sudden increase in red and sugar maple across the oak forest was going to be an issue in the next generation. And you know, he was pretending doom. And sure enough, that's one of the earliest papers looking at sugar maple invasion on our properties. So it's been out there and it's just slowly coming around, but no one was thinking about doing, well, not very few people were thinking about doing prescribed fire across the east in the 1970s that's for sure i was at penn state in the mid 90s and i wanted to burn i i had to go work with the tnc in long island to get fire on the ground uh they no one in pennsylvania wanted to do fire so it's slowly coming around in this new generation all righty thanks um we gotta i'll do it we're kind of past time but i'll do a couple more questions because i think they're really good ones sure. yeah um how old do oaks need to be in general to survive um, a fire and the example was could you burn a 15 to 25 year old reforested stand um, and and get away with that um well, a 15 to 20 year old stand, if I'm imagining it, is going to be like a dog hair thicket of maybe three to four inch, five inch trees, depending on the productivity of the site. And that would be that time period where, unless you wanted to kill a bunch of stuff, I'd probably stay out of a forest like that with fire. I think that makes the most sense there. Does that make sense, Chris? Yeah, 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 good answer. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'll, we've got several questions, but I think we only have time really for one more. Um, and somebody asked, has anyone gotten in touch with indigenous tribes uh, whose, uh, whose land this was to ask their suggestions about oak regeneration, restoration, management? That's an interesting question. I saw that too. And um, it's actually really timely because uh, we have sort of, as an industry, have uh, only begun here at least um, to start thinking in terms of, uh, of, of connecting with indigenous tribes about uh, land management and uh, really in, in the environment in general. Um, one of the kind of cutting edge uh, entities for that type of work is uh, up in the Joe Davies area with the, the JDCF. Uh, Steve Barg, who's their executive director, is really uh, doing a great job of sort of forging the path of communicating with indigenous uh, peoples and, and figuring out where they fit, uh, whether it's, you know, repatriation issues or, or just, uh, you know, care of the land itself, um, even, even just sort of making ourselves um, more aware and sensitive to, uh, to those topics. And so um, he has done several good uh, presentations uh, for Vital Lands Illinois, which is kind of a statewide conservation organization, um, to uh, sort of shine a light on uh, how those connections are best done and, and uh, give us all maybe some um, kind of best practices and, and pointers for, for making that communication happen. And again, I, I say we're in the infancy of that. You know, we, we have not, to my knowledge, uh, gotten very far on that down here but I know that other entities have in the state. Um, so that, that's a good, a good comment and definitely something that needs to be considered. All right, thanks, Jesse. Uh, one last question, I'll sneak in just cause I want to. Um, what about fire and river and bottom lands? Is that still a valuable process uh, in those lower ecosystems? I was just about to reach out to Russell when you mentioned that Charles, or excuse me, Chris. So um, I was about ready to say that really genuine, Generally, bottom lands are quite wet. Fire doesn't move across them very well unless they have like the perfect vegetation that dries out. So if you think about like uh, post oak flatwoods throughout central and southern Illinois, they're wet nine months of the year, but once or twice a, a year, they get really, really dry and they are fire adapted and they need fire to move through them. So it's really the site, species, vegetation mix that you might have on that particular site. I'm not saying bottomlands don't burn, it just has to be the right drought conditions, the right weather patterns, and the right vegetation. All righty, thanks, thank you so much. We're gonna have to end it there. Um, I definitely wanna thank 
Charles and Jesse for putting the time in and, and giving this great presentation. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And I hope to see everybody um, back tomorrow at two o'clock when we talk about invasive species. Chris, Chris, um, do, do, do all of the participants have like Jesse and I's email in case they have an extra question that comes up? Certainly share our emails or my emails, at least I don't want to speak for Jesse, but share my email. I'd be happy to answer questions and send some reprints or whatever they might want. Great, I certainly do that. Or why don't you type it into the chat box, Charles, just like yeah. Jesse did. Yeah, um, I see so that. While we're signing off, people can grab that from there. And um, again, thank you everybody for attending and I hope to um, see everybody or hear everybody tomorrow. All right, thanks a bunch. Thanks for having us, Chris. Yeah, thank you.